I have a question I would like to ask you because you are in this secret and yes. uh, it has a, a worldwide impact. And I would love to know because not everybody has resulted with this secret. It's great because it helps to open the mind. According to you, what's missing for the, in this secret to help the people who are still struggling? Well, the secret's only an introduction to an idea. Yeah. It's an introduction to the law of attraction, but it doesn't explain it with any depth. You need to go and get more information, more books, other movies, get the follow-up. Mm. In short, the idea is people think the law of attraction works on their conscious mind, but it actually works on their unconscious mind. Yeah. So if people sit and consciously think, I'm going to attract a car or a bike or a romance or better health, that's fine. But if they have unconscious beliefs, what I call counter-intentions, they can stop what they want to come into their lives. So the secret was an introduction, but it doesn't explain everything. As yeah. an introduction, it's beautiful. And thank God we made it, you know, it's, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, it's very powerful. So the next step is to go deeper. And Absolutely. Okay, so according to you, what could be the next step for the people who are following us now? Well, the next step is to understand how the unconscious mind works. Yeah. The conscious mind doesn't have all that much power. We think it does, and we sit and visualize, and we, we do our scripting, and we do our affirming. But again, the powerhouse is the unconscious mind. That's the next step. That's where we have to go, because all of our beliefs, all of our memories, all of our data, all of our negativity, all of it is in the unconscious mind. When we clean up the unconscious mind, then you can consciously ask for something, and more often than not, you'll get it, and you'll get it very fast, because you won't have any interference. The mm. interference comes from your own unconscious mind. And uh, you, are, you are well known to help people to attract what they want. So how we can do to um, communicate with the subconscious and um, to help him to help us? <laughs> well, the first thing to do is actually ask for help from your own unconscious mind. Uh, the beliefs that are in your unconscious mind are not buried and they're not hidden. You can uncover them. You can tease them out. And you can do that by starting to ask questions like, what might I believe that would stop me from attracting money? What might I believe from a, stop me from attracting a romance? What might I believe to stop me from having better health? And you can start to have those beliefs surface. And then when they come up, because there could be things like, I don't believe it's possible. I don't believe I deserve it. Uh, I've never seen an example in my life. There's all kind of negativity that'll come up. Welcome it and question it. Ask yourself, do you believe it's true that you can't attract money? Do you believe it's true you can't attract your soulmate? Do you believe mm. it's true you can't attract better health or the romance or the job or whatever it happens to be? And what you're doing is slowly unearthing your own evidence, your own evidence for your limiting beliefs. As you look at them, you start to weaken them and then they can disappear. That's one way that you can do it. And when it disappears, you have to create new beliefs? Not really. Now, some people say you can replace old beliefs with new beliefs. I actually feel that you want to release the negative beliefs and what's there is more of a divine calling. What seems to be there is almost an underlying mission for you personally. It'll be different for me, different for somebody else watching, different for you. Uh, but when you get rid of the negative beliefs, that calling, that mission, that life path is there for you. You don't have to go and put new beliefs there. Mm. There's already a divine belief waiting Un for you. Unleash it. What's that? Unleash it. You can unleash it. You can live it at that point. There's no interference at that point. Mm, great. I would love to know also, according to you, we have to, who we have to become to have wealth. Uh, in order to become wealthy, yeah. the very first thing that people have to do is be okay with money. We have unconscious beliefs about money. I can say the question, or even this statement, I can say this statement, money is the root of all, and everybody's going to say evil. Well, think about this. If you consciously sit there and say, I'm going to attract more money, I'm visualizing more money, I am now becoming wealthy, but unconsciously you think money is evil, you're not going to want it in your life. You're going to push it away. Yeah. Or you allow a little bit to come into your life, and then you'll have an accident, you'll have a problem, there'll be a lawsuit, there'll be something to get rid of the money because unconsciously you think it's evil. So the first thing to do is make peace with money. Money's okay. Money's neutral. Money is nothing but some agreed upon means of exchange. The second thing to do is be okay with yourself. 
Most of us don't like ourselves. Most of us don't love ourselves. We don't appreciate ourselves. So when it comes to good things, we think we're not really worthy. We're not really deserving. We're not really good enough. And so whether it's money or the relationship or anything else that you think is good for you, you might think I'm not really good and you will push it away. So the two things to become wealthy, one is be okay with money itself. Second is be okay with yourself having money. Yeah, great. And I would love also to know because um, we have two categories. We have the professional category and the money category. Mm. And I can grow in the, money, in the money and grow in the professional. And the lot of people want to grow in the professional category uh, with the consequence they would have uh, money. Do you think uh, we have to focus on, mo on money before than having a, uh, my professional grow? Uh, or the inverse. Do you understand my question? I think I do, but here's my answer. Whether I understand your question or not, I have an answer. <laughs> 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 and my answer is, you are to pursue your life mission first. Whatever your professional calling is, you pursue that. You don't worry about money first. You worry about, am I doing what I'm here to do as my personal calling, my personal mission, my divine calling? As you do that, either money is going to come to you or at that point you can start to have an eye towards, well, how can I charge for this? How can I make more money for this? What are the rules of money that I can bring that into my life? But that's not the focus. Mm. There are numerous stories of people who have just followed their own dreams and by following their dreams, everything else fell into place. When you focus on money, you can actually put a block up from focusing on your own heart path, you know, following your own divine calling. So you follow, you, you follow your path and yes. what, you, what you want to do in this planet and you make link with money. Yes. Then you make link. Yeah. Walt Disney, the great movie maker, said he wanted to make money from his movies so he can make more movies. And I thought that is divine. That is clear. That's noble. That's the focus we all want to have. I'm an author. I want to write books that make a difference. I want them to make money only so I can keep writing books. It's not about the money. It's about following your divine purpose, whatever is unique for you, your calling, your path through life. So when we think about money, we have to find or oh, why, why I want this money, why I want to become a millionaire, why I want to become a billionaire. Well, money is a means to an end. Too many people focus on the money and they don't realize that what they really want is what the money will bring them. Yeah. So what I tell people is, okay, say you won the lottery or say you inherited money, say that you had some sort of abundance fall into your lap. What are you going to do with it? That's more important to look at because somebody may say, well, I've always wanted to open my own restaurant. Now I will open my restaurant. Well, then forget about the money. Focus on the restaurant. That's your dream. Somebody else might say, I've always wanted to write a children's book. Focus on the children's book, not on the money to get to the children's book. There's lots of ways to obtain what you want. Money is simply one of them. When we focus too much on money, we become blind to all the other possibilities that are around us. Things can be given to you, things Exchange. can be won. There's all kinds of exchanges, bartering, any number of possibilities. Money is only one of them. Right, I love, I love that. Um, I was reading a short biography of you yes. and I would love that you tell your story and how did you start because you, f you, you are talking about find your purpose mm. and uh, I believe that you were struggling and you had some experiences to change your life. Can you tell me uh, that? How did you start? <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> the time I, you give me. <laughs> right. I, I, have, uh, I don't have a short story. Um, I was homeless. I was in poverty for a very long time. I did go through the struggles, the dark night of the soul, and throughout it all I was trying to find what was my purpose, what am I here to do. Throughout my life I had played with different possibilities. I thought I was going to be a magician at one point, an entertainer. I thought I was going to be a lawyer at one point, which I think is funny today. I thought I was <laughs> going to be a detective at one point. I thought I was going to be a baseball player at one point. I was trying to find myself. When I decided that I wanted to be an author, and I decided because I realized I can be all of those different characters in stories that I could write, it felt like being an author had more power. And as I sat with that and pursued that, I realized that I wanted to write things that made a difference in people's lives. At first, I wanted to write comedy because I thought, well, if I could make them laugh, 
they'd be able to forget their problems. And the first real success in writing I had was I wrote a one-act play that was produced in Houston, I think it was in 1979, and it won first place. It was a, it was a comedy. And I got a taste of this might be my calling to go in this direction of having people change their lives. So I just began pursuing it. It took a long time for me to get through my own limiting beliefs because I had beliefs about money. I had beliefs about deservingness. My self-worth was horribly low. Whenever you've been homeless or you've been in poverty, you really struggle with, am I worthy of life itself? Am I worthy of anything good? I had to go through all of that and pretty much did it by myself. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have a lot of the bells and whistles and gifts and lessons and teachers that we have. Thank goodness for the public library. That's where I live. That's where I got shelter. That's where I got my knowledge from all the other authors. And you built your own library now. Uh, now I don't go to the public library. I have my own private library <laughs> and I truly love it and I'm very grateful for it. So I just kept putting one foot in front of the other until things began to get published, things began to work out. I even wrote a book that was so impactful. A woman in Australia called me and said, I love your book, I'd like to put you in my movie. I'd never been in a movie before. Turned out to be The Secret, which changed my life, which put me out there on the radar for people to see. And of course, put me on Larry King, other movies, other opportunities like this, more books. So it's been a long road, but I went from homeless nobody to the lifestyle of the rich and famous. <laughs> yeah, so you find your path on your path. That's a very good way of saying it. You f part of finding your path is the path. And what I encourage people to do is look at where do you get the most joy? Where do you get the most fun? What would you do even if the money wasn't involved? You'd want to do it even if you weren't paid. Mm. I love writing so much. It doesn't matter that I get paid for it. I would prefer it because it enables me to have a lifestyle that enables me to keep writing. But even if there was this world where I wasn't getting paid for it, I'd still get up and write because I think it's my mission. It's my personal calling. Each person has one. I think each of us has our own piece of the puzzle. I once gave a talk where I passed out a jigsaw puzzle. And I said, everybody take a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And I stood in front of the group and I said, okay, look at your piece of the puzzle. And they would look at it and it makes no sense because all I have is that one irregular piece. But I said, when you take your piece and we all come up front and we put our piece on the table, it makes this beautiful painting. Yeah. That's life. You have a piece of the puzzle. I have a piece of the puzzle. These people have a piece of the puzzle. When we all contribute our passion, we follow our calling, life works. <laughs> I, lo I love that. Um, I would love to know because I love the topic of luck and I, uh, to be lucky. Yes. And I think we can build uh, a luck skill. Right. And I would love to know, according to you, why um, do you belong to the top experts now? What are the differences, according to you, between every expert? Because there are a lot of coaches, a lot of authors, yes. a lot of speakers, and there are only top 2% who make the dif a lot of di uh, big difference. Mm. According to you, why, what are the differences? Well, I would find that there's two or three things that are going on that make some coaches stand out among other ones. One is being an author. Whenever you're the author of a book, you're perceived as the expert on that subject. Even the word authority has the word author in it. I've written a lot of books. At this point, I've written 50-some books. Those books help put me up there on a, on a bit of a pedestal because they say, well, this guy must know what he's talking about because he's written so many books. I've written books on marketing, advertising, publicity, self-help, yeah. spirituality, <laughs> inspiration, all of this. I'm having a blast doing it. But when people read these books, they think, well, if they want the guy who really knows about uh, the Hawaiian healing method called Ho'oponopono, for example, they go to the guy who wrote the book on it. Me. I wrote Zero Limits. So that's the first thing going on. The second thing is they go for the most notable, the person who's most publicized out there. When they see I'm in several movies, I think I'm in 13 movies at this point besides The Secret. I've been on Larry King. I've been on ABC, national news, global news. I've been around the planet. So people see me, I'm very visible. I'm going to stand out among people who are not writing books, not being visible. Mm. And then the third thing are the results. You want to look and see, are these people, these different coaches and consultants, actually getting results from people following their methods? I have a long list of people, tens of thousands of them, who write all the time. We're compiling even a book 
of nothing but testimonials from people who have followed Miracles Coaching, which is a program of mine, my books, my ideas, my techniques, and they've had changes in their lives. So those three things, you know, it's the getting results, yeah. being pub uh, public, um, in the public eye, yeah. and writing books, being an authority. It's great, I, I love that. Right. Um, I have also a question about hypnotic writing. Yes. Um, what is it and how can, we, how can I, for example, learn to do that? Well, the, the, the easiest thing to do to learn hypnotic writing is read my book called Hypnotic yeah. Writing, which goes back to, if they want to know about hypnotic writing, where do they go? The author of the book. <laughs> yes. I wrote Hypnotic Writing. What is hypnotic writing? It's a way of using language to engage people and hold their attention. Why is this important? Because we have so many things pulling on us, whether it's our email or other websites or phone calls or faxes or visitors or any number of things that unless your writing is written in such an engaging, mesmerizing, hold their attention kind of way, you're not going to get read. They're going to leave you. They're going to go to another more interesting website, more interesting email, more interesting book. So it's essential you learn hypnotic writing. What is it when you break it down? It's a form of what's called waking hypnosis. There's sleeping hypnosis where traditionally your eyes are closed and there's a hypnotist talking to you and Eric's saying you're getting sleepy and all that good stuff. But waking hypnosis, your eyes are open. Very often when somebody's driving and they're going long distance, they may even fog out. That's fogging out is waking hypnosis. They're in a trance. They're still driving. And hopefully they're still safe. But their unconscious mind is the one taking them down the road. Well, you can create writing that puts people in a waking tra trance. It's so engaging, they don't want to stop reading. Great novels have often done this. Some nonfiction books have done this. I wrote a book on how to do this. Some of the elements in it are storytelling. When you've asked me questions throughout this little interview here, I've often told you stories. Stories engage the mind. They hold attention. They also deliver a message without interference. Because consciously, people can put up barriers not to allow a message to get in. But when you tell a story, their unconscious mind listens, their conscious mind listens, and they can listen, make their own deductions from that story. Mm. So there's a lot to it, but in short, read my book. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, uh, I would love to know, to know your point of view. Um, there, there are um, pages of sell, sales, sales page. Sales page, okay. A big sales page, and yes. there are others more short. What do you believe? Uh, in short, the more expensive the item, the longer the copy needs to be. So, if I'm selling a jet plane, and I'm going to ask you for a couple million dollars, I better write long copy to convince you why this program is, so, why this jet is so uh, valuable, and why you should go and pay for it. If I'm only selling a pack of gum, and it costs 25 cents, I don't need a whole lot of copy to get you to pay 25 cents for a pack of gum. My rule of thumb is the higher the ticket price for the product or service, the longer the copy needs to be. Now, I'm not saying write 30 pages yeah. just because it, I want long copy. It needs to be hypnotic. It needs to be interesting. People will often say, well, I don't read long copy. And I'll say, do you ever read a magazine article? Long copy. You ever read a book? Yeah. Long copy. You ever read booklets or any number of other things in literary form or on your iPad? Long copy. What's the difference? Well, they considered the sales letter to be boring or junk mail, so they said they didn't read it. What that tells me is it wasn't written in a hypnotic way. People will read any length of copy if it's of interest to them. So, higher ticket item, longer copy. Great. And do you use it in, in a video, for example, or in, on stage to, to, do, uh, to sell your, another product? I absolutely do. In fact, I just came out with a DVD called Hypnotic Speaking, which is a parallel to the hypnotic writing. And this is an analysis of what I'm doing on stage. I'm using the very same techniques I use in writing. I'm using the very same techniques of hypnotic writing right now with you. I'm doing all of this. If I felt that I was trying to sell you on th something and I have nothing that I'm trying to sell you, I don't need to go into long copy. But if I did, you know, when I wanted to point to one of these guitars and tell you it's $50,000 for this guitar, you'd probably go, unless you know guitars, you'd probably reel back and go, why? Why is it worth $50,000? That's when I would have to give you a long narrative to explain why it's valuable. It might be the entire history of the guitar or the luthier who made it. 
So yes, on stage, I will have long copy if it's necessary, short copy if I'm giving away something or it's a small ticket item. Great. Thank you very much. Napoleon Hill told about um, the mastermind and you have, yes. you have a book about that. So how to easily create your, uh, your own mastermind? Yeah, I wrote a book called Meet and Grow Rich with Bill Hibbler about creating your own mastermind. And these days it's far easier because of the internet. And if you're willing to meet online, all you have to do is go on Facebook and start looking at the different groups there to find a group that's of interest to you. Either participate with that existing group or find the people who are posting a lot, they're very interactive, and ask those people by personal invite, would you like to be part of a mastermind I'm starting online? You can have a separate Facebook group for this, or you can have a separate email group for this, or you can tell these people you want to meet by phone. Personally, I prefer meeting in person. Now, that, uh, that's more a matter of going to the local events, which could be Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, civic groups, church groups, things like that, and announcing what you intend to do. You want to create a, a mastermind on internet marketing, for example, or a mastermind on parenting. I don't know. It can be any number of things. But it's putting the word out, putting the feelers out, and inviting people to come. Keeping in mind, you don't want too many people Six yeah, people. That's my next question. <laughs> yeah, six people is about right. If you have too many people, not everybody's going to get a chance to say what's on their mind or to be involved. Too few people, like if it's only one or two or even three, it may yeah. not be enough to get the energy and the resources going. My rule of thumb is six people, seven people is probably comfortable. Yeah, and uh, according to you, how often we have to meet? I want to meet regularly, but that could mean, uh, to me, I like to meet once a week. But you have wow. to look at everybody's schedule because they may prefer to meet once a month. Yeah. When I meet once a, a week, I know that the energy stays up and there's something that goes on with the mastermind with that. Accountability goes up. So if I say by next Wednesday, I'm going to have a blog post done or a new product released, by next Wednesday, in the back of my mind, I'm going, I really need to get that done because I'm going to face the group. And the group won't pu put my feet in the fire, but they're listening to find out, does Joe do what he says? I want to honor my word. So if I'm meeting on a weekly basis, it keeps my energy up, keeps the momentum going, I can help everybody else, and it also helps me. And uh, how much time do you take in a mastermind? In general, we try to have 15 minutes per person. So it can be 10 to 20 minutes per person. You might even stretch it to 30, but you got to keep in mind, if you've got six people there and they're meeting 30 minutes each to say whatever's on their mind, you're spending the entire afternoon there. So I find if it's 10, 15, 20 minutes, people are focused. Then they can say, here's what's on my mind, here's what I need, here's how I can contribute to the rest of the people in the group, move on to the next person. And do you have someone who organizes each time the mastermind? Yeah, there is should it? be somebody who's more or less a timekeeper. Somebody who is running the group to say, we're going to meet next Wednesday, we're going to meet at the steakhouse, or we're going to meet online, or we're going to meet in a telephone group, here's the phone number. That person should also be the watch uh, keeper. They should be looking at the watch and saying, okay, you go. And then they look, you have five more minutes. And so they're the timer in a polite way, just to keep everybody on track. And do you have a topic each time? No, it's more or less, uh, I mean, masterminds can be variable, and so the mastermind itself might be topic-oriented. But in general, the masterminds I've been in have been more on a personal level. So you might come in one day and say you're working on a movie. I might come in one day and say that I'm working on my next book. So it's not really a topic-specific, it might be goal-specific, but for the most part, six people are getting together to support each other. And do you think we can build a mastermind with a kind of competitors? Or with competitors? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I love talking about that because a couple yeah. of copywriters out there in the world are perceived as competitors of mine. And they are my best friends. We share ideas. We mastermind. We help each other. Yeah, I think and so. this is one of the things that I think works. Instead of looking at people as competitors, look at them as allies. And you can learn from their business and, and I can learn from theirs as well. Um, I would like to ask you something to be authentic. It's the first time I talk about that. I want to build some mastermind. Some people ask, ask me to belong to their mastermind, but I have a feeling that uh, maybe the mastermind is at this level and in two months I will be there. In four yes. months I will be there yes. because I'm growing fast. Right. And so according to you, do I have to wait or just contact the people I want to 
yeah. hang out with. Uh, I would contact the people that you want to hang out with. And you have real wisdom there when you say that you don't want to be in a mastermind uh, with people who are on the same plane. And that's not meant as an insult. It's like people are in different places, status-wise, experience-wise, resource-wise. And in general, you want to be in a mastermind that's a level above where you're at because you want to be raised up to that level and keep on growing. So masterminds might even change over time. Um, but if you have your eyes on certain people or a kind of mastermind, I'd start your own mastermind. I'd either invite myself to their mastermind or say I'm creating another one. And then you have to give the reasons why you think they should go to it. What's in it for them? Mm. So you have to think about that pretty uh, deeply and yeah. be able to convince them. You might need a long copy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have two last questions. How can we become losers? How can we become losers? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Don't follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. Don't follow your intuitions. No intuition. Don't act on your opportunities. Okay. Uh, don't take any action on any good ideas, recommendations, uh, advice, <laughs> intuition, <laughs> dreams, passion. Ignore all of it. Oh, yeah. Ignore all of it. And you know what? That's how I went homeless. Oh, it's great. Because I kept ignoring little voices in my head that would say, uh, apply for this job, or go to this town, or uh, write this particular piece. And I would think, that wouldn't work. I would think I was smarter to my, than my intuition. And as long <laughs> as I thought I was smarter than my intuition, I was a loser. Oh, you were, you were an expert before. I was an expert at losing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you have some life lessons you would like to share to use? Yeah, the greatest life lesson for me is to appreciate the moment. And this is part of what I am teaching people when I get on a soapbox about, is that this moment right now is absolutely wonderful. It is just divine, perfect. When we start to think about the past, whether we fantasize about it or miss it or complain about it, or we start to think about the future because we're dreaming about that and we're fearing it or worried about it or wanting it to be a, per, a, a particular way, we've missed this moment. This moment is the point of power. This moment is where all the action is. When we think about the past, we do it in this moment. When we think about the future, we do it in this moment. And everybody thinks, well, when I get the relationship or the job or the money or the health or whatever, then I'll be happy. <laughs> you can be happy right now. And here's the grand joke, the big insight. When you're happy now, you can speed up the re attraction of all those other things you said you wanted. Wow. But you have to be happy now. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>